Good morning. I feel great this morning. My coffee is almost empty, which means my caffeine is starting to set in. And it's a good, good day because of that. And also for several other reasons, but mostly because of coffee. Uh, it is a good day. Uh, last week was an awesome week here at Thrive. If you were here, it was tailgate Sunday. The band was out in the lobby. There were hot dogs for breakfast, the breakfast of champions. I mean, it was good. Am I right? It was good? Yes, good. So let's... Uh, if one of us claps, we all clap. That's the rule around here. So how about that events team last week pulling that off, right? Come on. All right. Good. If you are not yet plugged into a team and you love big event Sundays like that, they're a great team to get involved with. Uh, or just stop by the info table, get involved at any team. We would love to help have your help serving around here and uh, making Thrive possible week after week after week. And can, can we also acknowledge this morning there were three generations of Moors up here playing? We had Scott and Matt and, and Helena, who's attached to Matt, they, their package deal, and Sid over there rocking it out this morning. That was awesome. So last week, I was getting ready for Tailgate Sunday, and I was doing shopping at uh, all of the fine establishments around Mount Pleasant, getting all of the supplies we needed for Tailgate Sunday, and I stopped at the classiest of all of them, Walmart, and <laughs> that's where we go to spend the big money. And so I was at Walmart, and I'm walking around, and... If you're a parent in the room, can you just acknowledge with me how wonderful it is to go shopping without kids? <laughs> yes. You don't have to buy the random crap that you don't need. You don't have to try to appease them with a candy at the end of the trip. Like, it's just, it was glorious. And so I'm taking my time because I can. I don't have kids attached. And I'm walking down, and I'm watching this lady. She's got one of those carts. You know how the ones, they have that extra seat in the back, like there's that extra attachment for two kids in the back there. So she's got one of those, and she's got this little girl in there. And this little girl is like me. She, she is straight up me because everything she walked by, she put her hand out and just touched it as they all went by. <laughs> I am a kid in every sense of the term, uh, except I have a larger body. But I'm a kid at heart. I've got, in my office, I've got a box that has Play-Doh and potato heads and a ping pong battle and ping pong ball, a paddle and ball, just, just because you never know when you're going to need it. My kids for Christmas got me a, a two-pound bucket of slime for my office because why not? I mean, th that is the stuff that makes my heart happy. And so I'm walking down this aisle, and this kid, I'm just smiling watching because this is not my kid, and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> And so we're going down the aisle, and we're going through the marshmallow aisle, which is the best of all of the aisles. And so she's touching every marshmallow bag as it goes. And the mom is over here focused on this, and this little girl's just touching them all. And they just start falling, like one, one by one by one by one. Like, so she's leaving this trail, and I'm pretty sure it's so she knows how to get out at the end of the shopping trip. She can just follow her trail backwards. But all I'm picturing is, one, this is not my kid and uh, not my problem, uh, and two... I just, for some reason, saw uh, Ghostbusters and the giant Stay Pushed mar Marshmallow Man. You know, I just, I, my mind is weird. But that's what I saw as I went down this aisle. And it just made me happy because I'm just living my best life, shopping for Thrive and, and living it up. And then we, we both, I think she knew what I was shopping for because she turned down the next aisle, the condiment aisle. And uh, that's where the pickle jars are, by the way. And this little girl <laughs> starts putting her arm out. And this is like slow motion now. You can see the pickle jar just go. <laughs> Did you know they make pickle jars in plastic now? I was waiting for this super climactic, like, shattering, and it, it, it bounces. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> this was going to be awesome. Uh, but it bounced, and then it hit the lid, and then it broke open <laughs> on the second bounce. And mess everywhere and I just smile because not my kid <laughs> not my turn for the mess and, and I told that story to Elijah my nine-year-old afterwards and he's like well did you eat the pickles <laughs> that's what he got out of the story that's of all of the life lessons he could have taken away he wanted to know if I ate the pickles I did not I did not. He would have, though, confidently. My kids are funny. Uh, they're, they're hilarious. And luckily for me, they don't make a mess at home. They never do. I love a clean house. I am the person who will just throw things away because it's sit on the counter for too long. And confidently, at least once a week, Dad, did you throw that away? Yes. Yes, I did. Dad, did you throw away that thing I need to bring back to school? Probably. 
that's that's me. My no, I'm my kids. They're so clean. Never. That's not true at all. I can't. I can't even keep going with that because it's not true. My kids are kids, and they leave a mess everywhere. But they're so funny about it because. Kenzie, she's, uh, she's four, and she's at this kick where it doesn't matter what you say. You can ask her any question. Her response is always, uh, yeah, why would I not? <laughs> Kenzie, did you have a good day at school today? Uh, yeah, why would I not? <laughs> did you play with your friends? Uh, yeah, why would I not? <laughs> did you have a snack? Uh, yeah, why would I not? Kenzie, will you help clean up the house? Uh, yeah, why would I not? And then she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but she knows the right sassy answer to give me. And then there's Liam. Yes, was it yesterday? Probably we had this mess on the counter, and he, he started scooping it into the trash can, and it just went all over the floor. He missed the trash can completely. Fortunately, we have two dogs who will lick anything off of the floor, and so it cleans itself. But as soon as it, like, fell on the floor, he yells, clean up aisle kitchen. <laughs> like, what? What? <laughs> what are you even talking about, kid? That's my life. That's my life in a nutshell. We are a messy, messy people. We are messy people. We leave a mess everywhere we go. And uh, my job here at Thrive is to clean up as much of our mess as I can. I put order to it. Uh, my name is Dave, by the way, if I haven't met you. Hi to the online community. Uh, I'm our executive pastor here. And really, that is my job, is to try to create some sort of order in the mess of what we do. Churches are messy. They, we are filled with messy people. And forever, the traditional church model was to try to clean up that mess and make the most beautiful presentation you possibly can where everything's perfect, no one has any flaws, <laughs> we all look our Sunday best, we act our Sunday best, and off we go, right? The model was if you behave a certain way and you believe the right things, then you can belong. You can belong to our community. You can belong to our church. Since the beginning, our philosophy has been the complete opposite. You belong here. There's a place for you. Everybody's welcome here. You belong here. And in belonging here, we think that you're going to learn how to believe. You're going to learn about Jesus. And by learning how to believe Jesus, you're going to learn to start behaving the way Jesus asks us to. We're not going to expect you to be perfect, ever. But especially at the front door. Like, why in the world would we expect somebody who's just figuring out faith, who's asking faith questions to have it all figured out before they even step foot in the door. Like, no, nonsense. So if you belong, you learn to believe, you learn to behave. Like, it's this process. We are going to say it in this series as everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible. Everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, anything's possible. We believe that as a church, and that's the church that we want to create. That's the church we've been creating. That's the reason that we're trying to do this whole Forest Central Michigan campaign to build a, a permanent space, a home for this church, a home for the community where people can belong. First and foremost, you belong. doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. Everybody's welcome. Everyone's welcome. Come on in. Like we'll, we'll take care of you. We'll love you where you're at. We'll help you through whatever you're going through. That's the type of community we want to create, one where you belong, where everyone's welcome. The, the history of the church is not any different than the history of people because uh, if you look at Scripture, it's divided in two halves, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament before Jesus came, New Testament after Jesus came. And uh, I've been actually working through the book Core 52. I don't know if you've, we've talked about it before. If anybody wants it, there's copies at uh, the store. Um, but it takes you through one memory verse every week, and I've been doing it with my nine-year-old son which has been a lot of fun. And so uh, we each have five verses memorized from that already, and we're going to keep digging into it. But it, it takes all of, in my Bible, it's, it's small print, this much is about how God created a perfect world and everything was great. And then in chapter 3, verse 6, Eve takes a bite of the fruit that God said not to eat. Adam eats with her. And the rest of this, is about God working and showing up and getting involved in the mess so that he can bring hope to that mess. Th do you see the difference? Yeah. See the difference? Like, this, this, is, this is us. We're messy. It takes a lot of work to bring order to the chaos, to, to get us out of the mess. But God doesn't keep himself at arm's length. He digs right in, and he helps, and he shows up. And he offers this gift of grace. And if you've been involved in a church for any of your life, you've heard the word grace. If you've not been involved in church, you understand the word grace. It, it may or may not have different contexts. 
but we all define it differently. It's a hard word to put a definition on. And so if you are a note taker, take note of this. If you're a picture taker so you can remember things, take a picture of this. This is the, the definition we're going to be working with off of the next three weeks in this series of what grace is. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. It is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. That's been offered to you. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You can't merit it by any sense of the word. It's just a gift that's been given to you. The gift given to me, Christmas time. Elijah gave me a two-pound bucket of slime, which seems like a silly gift, unless you know me, in which case you know this is the perfect gift uh, because this is just fun. My favorite thing to do with it is this. <laughs> just because it's fun. Don't judge me. It's just who I am, right? But this is, this is us, and, and God just digs right into the mess. By the way, did you know that if you leave slime in a truck for three days in Michigan winter, it will freeze? <laughs> I learned that this morning. Never would have thought it. I had to put this on the popcorn uh, oil warmer back in the concession stand just to get it thawed back out this morning. But God digs right in. He's not afraid of the mess. He digs in and he says, you know what, you're, you're messy and that's fine. I'm going to come be a part of that and I'm going to help restore. I'm going to give you a gift of grace. You don't deserve it. You have done nothing to earn it. You couldn't do anything possibly to earn it, but it's a gift from me. And so he offers that. By the way, also when you thaw slime, it turns much slimier. It's not as clean as it used to be. I'm going to need to wash these pants later. Uh, that's actually pretty gross. Um, but that's what it is. In the New Testament, uh, there, there's a writer named John. And John talks uh, all about Jesus, especially at the first chapter, is kind of an introduction to Jesus. And he says in his first chapter, verses 15 and 16, he says, Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Anything you've been given, there's something new that's been given that's so much better. For the law was given through Moses, that's the Old Testament, the law, the rules we had to follow. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus showed up and he gave grace. He gave you a gift, unmerited, unearned, undeserved, a gift for you. A gift for you to help with the mess. Now, Jesus is fascinating because a lot of people expected a lot of different things out of him. They expected him to be a king. They expected him to be, like, super authoritative. They expected him to rule with an iron fist and to hang out with the right crowds and to teach the right people the right things, and which is great because that's what he did. He hung out with these people. This is Jesus. He hung out with the kind people, the worthy people, the beautiful people, the rich, the ones who had their lives together, the bald, the perfect, which... Uh, This is great. <laughs> However, that's not who he hung out with. Instead, he hung out with the sick, the poor, the hurting, the prostitutes, the drunks, the self-righteous, the lonely, the sinners. This is who Jesus hung out with. He knew in order to fix the mess, you got to be a part of the mess. You got to dig right in there. You can't be afraid of it. You got to help the people who need the help. Now, Mark is, is another gospel writer in the New Testament. He, he told the story about Jesus. He says this, uh, Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Now, how would you like that for a title? E either one, really. Tax collectors and the disreputable sinners. Like, yeah, you both, yuck. Like, tax collectors were the worst of the worst and the other disreputable sinners because, you know, you're just one of them. And I like the parentheses afterwards. There were many people like this among Jesus' followers. As if we have to clarify that. That's good. Uh, but when the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, these are the self-righteous people, they saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Just really takes it next level there, doesn't it? Such scum. After Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. Jesus came for the people who are messy. He came for the people who don't have everything together. He came, he came for the people who don't have all the answers, who know that they need help. That's exactly who he came for. That's this idea that everyone is welcome. Everyone's welcome. I don't care where you are in life right now. In this church, in this place, in this 
body of believers, this body of also people who are asking questions, you, you are welcome. You are welcome here. People have this idea that, you know, sick people are the ones to be avoided. You know, you don't want the coronavirus or, or as uh, Jason described, the thing that's been going around our county, the Wu-Tang virus. I don't know why he decided that's what it's going to be called. But now every time somebody coughs around the office, you just hear someone else go, Wu-Tang! And that's, <laughs> that's my office in a nutshell, you know? We are a weird, weird bunch of people. But we judge the sick people as if they, they don't, you don't earn this, you haven't deserved this. We, we hold our own measuring stick, our own standard for what we think is right and wrong. And that's not helpful because we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. None of us deserves it. None of us have earned it. None of us could merit the gift that Jesus has given. We're all there. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. Now, speaking of our office, this uh, last week we got new carpet installed in part of the office. There was some water damage. And so these guys came in to install the carpet. And uh, one of the offices that needed new carpet was mine. And they stopped in in the morning and they said, hey, uh, can you have your office cleared out this afternoon? We need to put new carpet in. I said, sure, I'll do it after lunch. And the guy said, all right, that sounds cool. And so I went to lunch and I came back from lunch and apparently they were impatient because my office was everywhere. Like what was in my office is now in the hallway and down the other hallway and in Shelly's office and in the break room. Uh, like it was everywhere, everywhere. And which is, it's not a big deal. It's fine. I would have helped. They wanted to do it. Less heavy lifting for me, I guess. But, and I was going to move offices anyway. I was shifting to a different office. Um, but one of the things I have in my office is this like big old round globe Edison bulb that just sits on a socket and I put it on my shelf. And uh, I was picking it up to move it. And it apparently it brushed against something. I'm not sure what happened. And all of a sudden I just heard pow and thousands of pieces of light bulb just everywhere. Lindsay's around the corner. Jason's in a different office and like shattered glass flew into their offices, flew down the hallway. It was everywhere. It was a hot mess. I cleaned it up. There were little kids running around the office. I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Stay away from here. There's glass everywhere. We cleaned it up. About three days later, we're still finding glass, but we're getting it. But let me, let me share why that's important. Why, why that resonated with me. Because Jesus said, if you are a Christ follower, you are to be the light of the world. You are to be the light of the world. He says this in Matthew 5. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The natural Christian tendency is once you've accepted Jesus... The greatest thing you can do is hang out with other Christians and be light in a room of other lights, and it's this really bright room. Except that's the opposite of what Jesus has asked us to do. Now, it's great to hang out with Christians. It's great to come together on Sunday mornings to, to grow and to be refueled and, and to enjoy our time together. But really, what he's, what he's asked us to do is take that light and go into the darkness and show it, to scatter the light. Not saying break yourself into a thousand pieces and, and fly like shards of glass across the room. I'm saying go into the darkness because the light is so much more effective where there isn't already light. And so you hang out with these people who need light and you share that light with them and you don't do it in a way that judges them and you don't do that in a way that where you become the self-righteous person who has somehow earned, merited, and deserved God's gift. But you humbly just show Jesus in the way that you love them, the way that you care for them, you welcome them in and teach them the, the way that Jesus has worked in your life. It's a beautiful picture of what's, what's, what we are to do. But it's so against nat natural instinct sometimes to just kind of huddle up or, or to bury that or to do something. Brendan Manning says this, Grace is sufficient even though we huff and puff with all our might to try to find something or someone that it cannot cover. Grace is enough. Everybody, everybody's welcome. Everybody's got a chance at grace because Jesus came for each of us. Not just you, not just the people around you, but for each of us. Everyone is welcome. Everybody. W you saw that video as, as this whole thing started, this idea of the plate falling and shattering. And for some reason, we all put this pressure on ourselves, and social media by no means helps us, by the way, where we have to present ourselves as this beautiful, perfect image Everything's great, never been used, never been cracked, 
not even a fork scuff on this thing. Like, this is just nice. Fresh off the shelf. Thank you, Walmart. <laughs> Fresh off the shelf. Like, this is how we feel like we have to present ourselves. But the reality... <laughs> the reality is we're much more like that. We're much more like that. Clean up aisle kitchen, like... <laughs> And so somehow we have these pieces of ourselves where we, we try to put this back together and we can't because we're broken, we're messed up, we've got flaws, we're struggling, got no energy left, no life left to give. It's just we're at the end of our rope. And what do you do with that? Let me share an idea. I love art. I love art of all sorts. I could hang out in an art gallery for days. Um, I, I love it. I could just sit and stare at things and see how people created different things. There's a Japanese art form. It's called kintsugi. Kintsugi. And uh, it's been labeled the art of precious scars. The art of precious scars. What happens is... Uh, in, in Japanese culture, you have these, these fine plates, this china, basically. Valuable plates, valuable pottery uh, of some sort. It's just precious, precious, priceless things that you have. But sometimes life happens, right? They get cracks, they get chipped, they're broken. Kintsugi takes gold, melts it down, and it melds all of the pieces back together with gold, filling in all the cracks. It ends up looking like this. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And after something's been broken and then mended with gold, it's actually more valuable than when it started. That's a picture of grace. That's it. We're broken. We've got scars. But God says, I will mend those. I will give you life. I will restore this brokenness, and I'll make you something more beautiful than you ever have been before. That's grace. That's, that's a beautiful picture. I sat in my office not too long ago uh, with a woman who, who sat in uh, my office chair, and she just wept. Wept. And she was pouring her heart out, and she was sharing some of the struggle of what she's gone through and the hurt and the heartache and life trials. And she says, Dave, I'm just too far gone. I'm too far gone. I'm lost. I'm hurt. I'm broken. She just kept sharing thing after thing after thing. And she said, I, I am too far gone. I'm too far gone. And I wept with her because there's something about a woman just weeping next to you where you can't help it. Uh, I don't care who you are. Like, it, it hurts. You can feel the heartache. And the only thing I could think of was the fact that that's, that's exactly who Jesus came for. You're not too far gone. You haven't done anything to remove you further from God's grace because we didn't earn it in the first place. You're not too far gone. And I shared with her, you are exactly who Jesus hung out with, people like you who are hurting, who are just beyond themselves, you are who Jesus came for. And it was this beautiful moment where we got to pray together um, and, and just weep together and share in the, the struggle of life because we're messy. I've talked to pastors all over the world, um, and <laughs> one of my favorite things that somebody's ever said to me is, boy, church would be so much easier if it weren't for the people, right? Because <laughs> we're messy. And yeah, it would, except how fun would that be? Like, it's not. I, that's not fun. People are messy, and I actually like that about people. I like order. I love systems. I love structure. I love cleanliness. I love all of that, but I love the messiness of people because if you're willing to be real with me, I'm willing to be real with you, and it's, f it's way more fun that way. Neither one of us have to pretend like we've got it together because we don't. We're all messy. We're all broken. So quit trying to be perfect and start seeing yourself as a work in progress. Like We're all growing. We're all figuring this out. We're getting this together, and that's who Jesus came for. That's what he came to be about. And if you don't expect yourself to be perfect, 
but you understand that God is working in you. You're not going to see other people around you as perfect, and you'll understand that God is working in them. And there's so much grace to be offered. Nobody's too far gone. You are all welcome. You're all welcome. Not just here at Thrive, but in God's kingdom. Like God has opened his arms to you and says, come, come be a part of this. Like My gift of grace is for you. My gift of grace is for you. Uh, I, I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect either. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, next week, the idea is nobody's perfect, and Michaela's teaching next week, and it's going to be phenomenal. I've heard some of the stuff she's been preparing, and it's, it's so good. So make sure you're back for, for next week. But, but the big idea today, everyone's welcome, means this. At Thrive, you're welcome. I don't care who you are, where you're from, your life story. I care about your mess. I do as a person. I also don't care about your mess because it's not going to change the way I think about you. We're all messy. Like, yeah, good. Let's do this together. Um, but everyone's welcome. We're all in this together. We're all a part of something bigger. We're all in need of a Savior. And so I want to invite you, if you have never accepted that gift of grace, I want to invite you to take a moment to do that this morning because Jesus has said it's, it's for you. It's available right now for you. He wants to take those cracks and make something beautiful out of it. That kintsugi art form, the art of precious scars. And if you're here and you've accepted that grace, but there's still little pieces of the old life that you're holding on to and you need to let go of, I want to pray with you about that as well. Uh, or if you just find yourself in a place where I, I just need to go be a light more and go keep sharing this grace that's been given to me. Good, I want to encourage you as well. So let's pray together uh, wherever you're at. Uh, God, I pray for the people in this room right now. I, I know there are some who are here who are just seeking things out and they know that they need something more than they've got themselves. And so, God, I pray that you work in them and you work through them. And if that's you, I just want you to, to pray in your mind with me. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. And to let him step in and help heal and restore and give grace and life and hope again. And for those in this room who who have accepted that grace and, and just need a, a fresh sense of hope. God, I pray that you give that today. You help us to move away from um, God, things that hold us down, the, the brokenness that we try to cling on to, uh, but we just allow you to work in our lives. Um, and God, for those who just need uh, the encouragement and the reminder and a sense of gratitude for what you've done, Lord, I pray that we live in that grace and we walk in that grace and we model that grace to those around us that we have not deserved it, we have not earned it, it is not merited by any sense of the word, but it is a gift of your kindness and your favor. So God, help us to live in that and to show that to those around us. Uh, God, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name.